Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Flying with the iPad, Your Digital Copilot. My name is Chris McGonigal, and I'll be your facilitator today as we cover a wide range of topics on Flying with the iPad and ForeFlight app. Today's presenter, John Zimmerman, will cover the basics from which iPad works best for each mission to discussing additional accessories and how to maximize the iPad's effectiveness with ADSB products. Reminder that today's webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube page in addition to all previous webinars. So without further ado, John, take it away. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks everybody for joining us. We are gonna cover a ton of ground today. I've got about 90 slides in about 60 minutes we're gonna to try to get through, uh, which will hopefully give some information for everybody, no matter where you are, whether you're new to the iPad or an old pro, uh, some new tips, maybe a new app to look at, maybe a new accessory. So we're gonna cover a whole lot of ground. Uh, I'm John Zimmerman, I'm your presenter today. I get to work at Sporties there, the most fun airport in America, we think, at Claremont County Airport in Batavia, Ohio. I work on a lot of new product development and marketing here. Uh, I also do a website, which I'll mention again in just a second, called iPad Pilot News with some colleagues here at Sporties. That is a free website all about the iPad and apps and accessories and uh, how you can fly with those more safely. Uh, I'm also a contributing editor for Flying Magazine, but more than anything today, I'm just gonna be sharing tips with you as a pilot. I fly a whole bunch of general aviation airplanes, uh, helicopters, tail draggers, uh, everything in between. And I've been flying with the iPad since it came out 10 years ago. And so more than anything, what I wanna share is my perspective as a GA pilot, probably much like most of you, and what I've learned along the way. Here's a quick overview of what we're gonna hit. As I mentioned, a lot of ground to cover. I wanna start with a quick look at the iPad hardware itself. There are some new things to talk about there just in the last month. So let's review what the options are there on the iPad hardware. Then we'll talk about some basic iPad flying strategies and some lessons we can all learn from professional pilots and how to be systematic in how we approach the iPad. Next, we're gonna talk about making your iPad your digital co-pilot. And this is a really exciting part for me because we're in sort of a third or fourth phase of the iPad where it's not just about looking at digital charts anymore. It's really about the iPad being a smart assistant in the cockpit. And so I'm gonna share some tips on how to do that, how to sort of go to the next level with your iPad. And then we'll close with some data link weather tips. This is one of the biggest uses of the iPad in flight. It's really revolutionized, I think, the way a lot of us travel over the last five or six years, whether it's ADS-B or Sirius XM. And so we'll review some of that, uh, what the options are, and then how to fly with it, how to be safe with that. I mentioned iPad Pilot News. This is a great cheat sheet. If you missed something today or you didn't quite pick it up or I moved too fast, I would encourage you to check out iPadPilotNews.com. We will have a video recording of this webinar on that website, but we also have a a whole host of articles, uh, how-to articles, tips and tricks, videos, webinar recordings. There's a newsletter that goes out twice a, week, a month by email. You can sign up for it. It's 100% free. Uh, there's no cost to subscribe, but lots and lots of great information. If you have a question about the iPad, I would encourage you to check that out. With that, let's dive right in. And as I mentioned, let's start with the actual iPad itself and what is new. Uh, somewhat lost in all of the uh, wild news of the last couple months, understandably, Apple did introduce some new iPad models. So there are now more options than ever. If, if you wanna describe to me the iPad you have, it, seven or eight years ago, it's pretty simple. I have the iPad one or the iPad two, or I have the iPad mini. Well, now there's a whole variety of them. You have iPad pros in different sizes. You have iPad air, you have just iPad, you have iPad mini. So here are the current models you can buy today. The iPad Pro line, which is the high-end, best screen, fastest processors, all the bells and whistles, that comes in an 11 inch and 12.9 inch size, and that refers to the diagonal size of the screen. The iPad Pro 11 inch is now in the second generation. Uh, they introduced uh, an earlier model of that about 18 months ago. The iPad Pro 12.9 is on the fourth generation. So if it's not enough to know you have an iPad Pro, you need to also know which screen size and which generation. Uh, so the latest ones there are the second gen and fourth gen, anywhere from 128 gigs of storage up to one terabyte of storage, which is a lot. And prices there start at 799. 
Moving down a little bit, you have the 10.5 inch iPad Air, second generation, sort of a mid-range model, the larger screen, but not quite some of the super high-end performance of an iPad Pro, but a better price as you can see starting at 499. The iPad, just confusingly called the iPad, is now a 10.2 inch screen, used to be 9.7, and it's on the seventh generation. This is kind of a great starter iPad. If you're not a real power user, you can get started for 329, and it's a pretty good performer. Um, and then finally, the iPad mini, that's on its fifth generation now. It's about an eight inch screen, and that is very popular with pilots for obvious reasons, because of its size, uh, and also a good uh, starting price. We get a lot of questions about how much you know, how much storage do I need? Uh, you know, is 32 gigs too small? Should I just buy one terabyte? We consider 64 gigs the minimum size for aviation. You can do it with 32, but you're basically going to only be doing aviation. You won't have much room left over for other apps. So 64 is a good uh, minimum. If you can swing 128 or 256, it's not a bad idea because remember, you cannot upgrade your storage a year or two down the road. So I always tell people buy as much storage as you can afford out of the gate because you'll probably use more than you think and you can't change your mind down the road. Those are the specs. Here's the screens. And this gives you a good sense for kind of how it works. On the far right is the just the iPad. And you can see that the overall case itself is a little bit smaller than the iPad Air and Pro 11, but not dramatically. You can see there's more of a bezel, the, the black space around the screen. Um, and that's probably the most notable difference. As you move up to the Air, it's a thinner iPad and the screen is a little bit bigger. And then when you go all the way to the iPad Pro, you'll notice the screen goes almost edge to edge, not quite, but that bezel around the edge is much, much thinner. And you also notice there's not a home button. Everything is done like the new iPhones with swiping up from the bottom. So what you're getting with an iPad Pro is basically all screen. It's sort of out of a 1960s science fiction novel where you've got nothing but a screen in front of you, no buttons, uh, no hardly any user interface, it feels like. So boiling that down, if you're looking to buy a new iPad today, and, and I don't think you should rush out and buy one of these, but if you have an older one, certainly if you have an older iPad Mini 2, for example, or an original iPad Air, it's probably time to start thinking about a new one because all, as apps get better and better, they require more and more horsepower. Um, and uh, eventually, iPads cannot upgrade to the latest version of iOS, so eventually that means you're sort of locked in time and you cannot upgrade your iPad or your apps. So uh, consumer electronics do not last forever, as we all know. Uh, I don't think you need to buy a new iPad every year or every two years, but if it's been three or four or five years since you've upgraded your iPad, you should maybe start thinking about it. If you're looking for high performance in a small package, I really like the new iPad mini five. It's not the blazing fast performance of an iPad pro, but it's plenty good enough. It's got what they call the A12 processor, which is plenty of horsepower for what we do in the cockpit. It has a lower glare screen compared to the older minis, which is really helpful. Uh, it has a home button. It supports the first generation Apple Pencil, and it's the same size as the original iPad mini. So if you had an iPad mini three or four, and you have a kneeboard or a mount you really like, the good news is you won't have to change that if you upgrade to a Mini 5. It's the same external dimensions. So this is a great option for saving some money and also in tighter cockpits. It's much easier to yoke mount or put on a kneeboard. It doesn't take up nearly as much space as the other ones. So definitely a good option if you're flying a 172 or a Cherokee or something where space is at a premium and a good way to save some money. If you want the best overall performer, uh, you're more of a power user, you really want to uh, get everything you can. I really like the iPad Pro 11. It's got a large screen. You can view approach plates larger than life. Uh, it's very bright, very bright screen, noticeably brighter than a mini. The fastest processor, it's got that anti-reflective screen coating as well. It has that face ID so you can unlock the screen with your face instead of a fingerprint or a passcode and it uses the new second generation Apple Pencil. This is a little bit larger, so it's harder to yoke mount for sure, but it's a great performer. It works well on a kneeboard, and uh, if you're looking for a little more performance or you have a larger cockpit, this would be my pick for the best overall performer. I have flown with an iPad Pro 12.9 inch. It does work, but for all but the largest airplanes, it's pretty big and pretty in intrusive in the cockpit, so that one's not as good for most pilots. 
Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. Here's an iPad Pro 11 on the left and an iPad Mini 5 on the right. That gives you a sense of the screen size. You can see that the Pro does fit in your lap, but it's big, uh, whereas the Mini is, is nice sort of kneeboard size and uh, fits real well there. You can see the screen brightness is brighter and sharper on the Pro, but it's not dramatic. It's not you know overwhelming. Um, and you can see that while both are lower glare than earlier iPads, neither one is glare free. So it's still a big chunk of glass and it will reflect sunlight. But the latest models with that anti-reflective screen coating and with the brighter screens, screen glare to me is a much less of an issue than it was on earlier generation iPads. It's still there, uh, but it's manageable. One other thing to keep in mind when you're talking about newer iPad models is the familiar charging cable. You may have six of these laying in your kitchen drawer somewhere. Things have changed a little bit there. So the, the old style charger is like you see on the right, where it's called USB-A. That's that sort of the larger plug. Uh, and then on the other end would be a, usually a lightning cable, a lightning connector to plug in. You still get that with some phones, some iPads, but more and more, especially with the Pros, you'll get what's called USB-C. And it's USB-C on both ends, both the end that plugs into the wall plug and the end that goes into the iPad. This is a bi-directional, newer, faster, overall better charging connector. Uh, but note that that is different. So if you've got a, an older iPhone or an older iPad and you upgrade to an iPad Pro, you will get a different type of charger that will not be compatible with your older ones. There are benefits there. One of them is faster charging options. So with the new iPad Pros and the newest Air and the, even the new Mini, they do charge up faster. They do sort of a boost charge to about 50% in half an hour and then more of a trickle charge. That is helpful if your iPad's, you know, 20%, you got to run out the door in half an hour to take a flight. It's nice to have that option. Uh, so it's a good thing, but just be aware of what your cords are, what your connectors are. You may end up with a mixed, uh, bag full of charging connectors, depending on what equipment you have. Some accessories from Apple, uh, they've had their, they announced their Pencil a few years back. They more recently introduced a second generation of this, Pencil 2. This is by no means a must have, but for the latest iPad Pro models in particular, it magnetically attaches right to the side of it and it makes a pretty good stylus. So if you wanna copy clearances and go totally paperless, this works pretty well. I've used this a fair amount in the cockpit and it's fine. You know, personally, I think your finger is pretty good too, but on smaller screens, or if you don't like using your finger, this is a good option and it just kind of works. There's no complicated pairing or anything. When it's attached magnetically to the side of the iPad, it is charging. So you also don't have to worry about another thing to charge, just leave it on your iPad. Um, and, and note that this is the second generation Apple Pencil that snaps on. The first generation, which works, works with some older models of the iPad and I believe the iPad mini, that plugs in the bottom, it's not quite as convenient. Um, but I would always tell people if you're buying an iPad Pro, you should at least think about this, especially if you fly IFR and you wanna copy ADIS and clearances a lot, something to consider. It's not inexpensive, but it does work well. The other accessory, and this is a new one for the new iPad Pros, is a new keyboard. And I only bring this up because for some people, this can become really their whole computer. It's their work computer, and then they take it in the cockpit, and it's their electronic flight bag. You can see there that it looks from the top down basically like a laptop, and that's essentially what it is. It attaches magnetically and can become a full real laptop replacement. Uh, it works really well. Again, it's not inexpensive and it's not something you need for flying. But if you're trying to make that decision of maybe I spend the extra money for an iPad Pro and it's going to be my all-in-one computer, that's something to think about. All right, so that's the hardware. That gets us all on a level field in terms of what's out there. Let's now talk about how to fly with your iPad like the Pros. And I say that because while General Aviation was the first to adopt the iPad, um, you know, we beat the airlines by years, in fact. We can look carefully at how the airlines and corporate aviation use the iPad, because like most things, they are very rigorous about that. They don't just start using it. They have procedures and uh, testing procedures and SOPs. And I think there's a few things we can learn from them because the iPad has become not just a gadget, not just a fun little toy to play with, it's really an essential part of the cockpit for most of us. If that's your primary reference for charts and flight planning and weather, that's more than just a toy. You should treat it seriously. And so let's look at a couple of considerations there. First of all, real quickly, just a review of the legalities. All of you by now hopefully know that the iPad or any tablet 
uh, if it meets certain requirements, is an, an approved replacement for your paper charts. You do not have to carry paper. It is a primary reference for navigation data. Uh, no worries about that. Specifically, the best things to read are Advisory Circular 9178. That applies to Part 91 operations, so private pilots, uh, pleasure flights, you taking your family on a trip. If you fly for hire, Part 121 airline, Part 135 charter, uh, you want to check out Advisory Circular 120-76D, and that applies to commercial operations. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just a couple highlights. 9178 is really pretty um, thoughtful and realistic. You know, it talks about flight bags, electronic flight bags, and there's no formal FAA approval required here. That's the key takeaway. You as the pilot in command self-certify that you have the functional equivalent of paper reference. Uh, you don't have your own hand-drawn charts. You have actual FAA charts in digital form, and it suggests a backup source, but notably it doesn't require and more than anything, the whole tone of the advisory circular is that you as pilot and command have decided and determined that this is safe. It doesn't interfere with cockpit electronics uh, and it has the required information. You do not have to get a TSO'd or STC'd iPad or you don't have to get a letter of authorization or anything like that. It's up to you, like most things in Part 91, it's up to you as a pilot and command. If you're flying for hire, things do get a little more complicated. Uh, this advisory circular is pretty long. It may be worth reading if you're a private pilot because there's some good best practices to consider there. But remember, it does not apply to you under Part 91. Some things they require is backup for aviation data, maybe a second iPad, maybe paper charts. It must be secured for takeoff and landing. You can't just you know lay it on your lap. Uh, you have to be thoughtful about battery life and, and how you monitor that and how you back it up. And it's also, I think, a very good idea. It talks about training for this, uh, that there's a formal training program, both initial and recurrent, for how you use your iPad. All good things for the most part. There is some formal approval required. So if you're flying for a 135 or 121 operator, you want to talk to your chief pilot or your FA contact and make sure you get the paperwork done. Some best practices to me that we can learn from this is have your own standard operating procedures you, you know uh, whatever matches your airplane your typical operation your experience but some key things to think about here are some type of ipad pre-flight some type of backup for data some type of backup for power and a mounting strategy you can go beyond that but i think those are the key ones to at least consider a pre-flight checklist can be pretty quick and again this varies depending on each operation and your personal preference but i always like to make sure that on some schedule i'm updating my apps so i have the latest bug fixes and features you definitely want to make sure your charts are downloaded and up to date before the, your next flight that is critical make sure your battery is fully charged as obvious as that is that is the number one way that an ipad is going to let you down is running out of power uh, wireless radio set, I like to turn on airplane mode, especially if you have an LTE iPad. Uh, I like to turn that on before flight to reduce the chance of interference and to save battery life. Uh, if you're going to use Wi-Fi to connect to a Stratus or Bluetooth to connect to a Garmin GDL, leave that on, obviously, but turn off the LTE. Screen brightness is the number one uh, draw on the battery. So if you can get by with lower screen brightness, I would suggest you turn it down and then make sure your backups are available. You can run through that list in 90 seconds um, and make sure you're ready to go. And I think it's a good idea to do that before a flight. Apps like ForeFlight have made it a lot easier to do this as well. Great features. Um, one I like a lot is Pack from the Maps page. If you put in a route, you'll see a little suitcase symbol with a, a red circle around it. That's reminding you, you need to pack for the route. And all you have to do is tap pack there and it will download the weather, the fuel prices, the notams, the charts for your entire route and a corridor really along your route. Uh, that way you don't have to download the entire US, but it's a great way to quickly get all the charts and information you need. Make it a habit to do this before every flight. Now, also, if you want to keep certain databases update, you know, you're, I'm based in Ohio, so I always want to have Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana charts downloaded. You can go to the more tab in the settings and turn on automatic downloads. This will let the app automatically download your pre-selected charts. So if, if I have Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana selected that I always want. When the app is open and has an internet connection, and when it detects there are new charts available, it will automatically download them. You don't have to remember to push the button. So that's a great feature to enable as well. 
So making sure you have your charts is good. And then what's your backup plan? What if that iPad decides to just lock up or overheat or whatever the case might be? You wanna have a backup for your data. That could be a second iPad. That could be a phone. That's my, that's my backup on a lot of days. I don't wanna navigate off my iPhone for primary reference, but in a pinch, especially the newer generation of larger and more powerful smartphones, ForeFlight on your iPhone does almost everything that you can do on your iPad. So it would be more than adequate in a backup situation. Uh, I think that's a legitimate backup. Just remember, if you're going to use your phone as a backup, you need to have the databases downloaded there as well as your iPad. Because an iPhone with an app but no data is not worth much. Of course, the ultimate backup is paper, and there's nothing wrong with carrying paper. You can buy the books or the charts or you can print them uh, off online. Some people like to do multiples. I know flight departments that have two iPads in every cockpit plus paper charts, and that's just fine. If that's what you wanna do to make sure you're covered, nothing wrong with that. But, but also have a backup for power. As I said, this is the most likely cause of an iPad failing is it doesn't break, it simply runs out of power. In typical use, you know, browsing the internet, you'll get maybe 10 hours with a typical iPad. In aviation though, we use these hard. We typically have the screen brightness turned up higher. We're typically using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to connect to an external device. Uh, the screen is on full time for a lot of pilots. So iPads working hard, it's more like four to six hours. Uh, and as an iPad gets older, it's more like three to four hours as that battery wears down. So have some plan there. There's multiple options. Uh, I really like the, the backup battery option, which you see there. That works in any airplane. You don't have to worry about a cigarette lighter plug or anything else. It's also useful outside of aviation. Or you can get one of those cigarette lighter chargers. This is cheap insurance for under 20 bucks. You can get one. Just make sure that if you buy one of those, it has a two amp or higher charging port. A lot of the cheap ones you find at the grocery store are made for phones and they're one amp. And iPads really like two, 2.1, 2.4 amps to charge. So make sure you get one with a high amp output. And then of course the ultimate would be some type of installed certified uh, USB charger. Like you see the Stratus Power there, Garmin has one as well. Um, these are more expensive because they're certified and they require installation. But if you own your airplane, I think this is a great idea because you could put one of these in, or I even know some people who put them in at each seat in the airplane. And then you never have to worry about power for your external devices. I've also, will tell you, passengers love this. Kids come on board with iPhones or iPads, they can plug right in. Uh, these are also the most reliable, you know, they're circuit breaker protected. They're usually the highest output. Some of them are three or 3.4 amps even of the output. So more expensive, but if you want to sort of uh, solve it once and forever and you own your own airplane, that's a great option. As I said, this is my favorite just because it's the all-in-one go anywhere. This is the Flight Gear battery backup. It's available in uh, 10,000 or 20,000 milliamp hour capacities. The nice thing here is it has huge capacity. 20,000 milliamp hours will recharge your iPad three or four times at least. But it also has multiple charging options. It has uh, all high amps, so th one's a three amp, two or 2.4 amp plug. So it'll charge an iPad and a Stratus or an iPad and a Sentry or two iPads at the same time. It's got lots of power and it's got lots of different connectors. The best part about that is you don't have to charge up the battery pack itself with some bizarre custom cable that you lose the first day. You can charge the battery pack itself with a lightning cable, just like your phone might have, with a USB-C cable, like your iPad Pro might have, or with a uh, micro USB. So it's very flexible both on the charging input and the charging output, um, which makes it a great option. So honestly, I have one of each of these sizes and they're in my backpack at all times. They're great for around the house. They're great for traveling by airline. They're great for flying with, kind of my Swiss Army knife for my iPad. If you're worried about your iPad's battery life, you feel like you're not getting great uh, production out of it, I'd encourage you to check out these uh, in the settings app, go to battery, and you can see for the last 24 hours or last uh, week, what is using your battery. Uh, and if it's things you've been using like ForeFlight or Safari, well, that's fine, that just is what it is. But if you see something on there you're not using a lot, you may have an app you need to delete or at least close out. So this is a great tool to check if you feel like, well, I'm only getting two hours of battery life. See if there's something in the background that's working. 
couple other backup plans to consider. If you fly maybe in, you know, the desert southwest where it really gets hot in the summer, there are some mounting options that have a built-in fan that can keep it co uh, cooler. iPads above a certain temperature will shut down to protect the battery and you'll get that black screen of death. The iPad will not turn back on until it gets cool. Um, and the x knot that we show there is the best I've seen. It does a really nice job of directing airflow where it needs to. The iPad will still shut down. You know, if you put an iPad in an oven, it will eventually get to temperature. But in our experience, this does really delay the onset of that shutdown by an hour or two. So for a typical flight, you can get through it with those fans going without overheating. Of course, the ultimate overheat would be a runaway battery fire. And these iPads do have huge lithium batteries in them. And occasionally lithium batteries can uh, go bad. And when they do, they can create a, a fire that you don't like. And typically traditional water, for example, will not help extinguish a lithium fire. Um, if you're in a 172, the answer, honestly, may be to open the window and throw it out. <laughs> but if you're flying up high, certainly if you're in a pressurized airplane, a smoke in the cockpit is a real problem. And that's where something like this tablet fire containment bag is helpful. They're not inexpensive, but they will uh, put out the fire and reduce damage if the battery should explode. Uh, I don't think this is a must have for everybody, but again, if you're flying a pressurized airplane, it may be something to think about and stuff underneath the seat just in case, because if that iPad runs away and gets hot, um, you don't have a whole lot of options at 30,000 feet. Finally, secure the iPad. There are dozens of options here, but I do think in general, it's a bad idea to just have the iPad sliding all around the cockpit. The two most popular options I see are the kneeboard or the mount. There are lots of kneeboard options. There are lots of mount options, yoke mount, suction cup. That really depends on the airplane and your personal preference. But I would encourage you to experiment and find something that works for you, keeps it in view without blocking too much and keeps it secure so it doesn't fly around the cockpit. One new option there to consider are these robust mounts. Uh, these are pretty inexpensive, all things considered, and they're also universal. So there's basically an iPhone and then an iPad model, both suction and yoke options. But because of this uh, series of fingers that they come with, it will adapt to fit a whole variety of iPads with or without cases. So if you don't wanna worry about a custom molded case and having to take it out of a protective sleeve, maybe this is a really good option. Uh, it'll fit almost any iPad ever made. On the kneeboard front, one new one I'd point out is from MyClip. They've made iPad kneeboards for years, but their new model is called the MyClip Multi, and it's really creative. It's got this sort of curving hook that attaches to two sides of the iPad, and it will fit any iPad, Mini through Pro, any tablet up to 0.85 inches thick with or without a case. It will fit even an iPhone 11. So this is my number one pick for a universal kneeboard. There are lots of other good options that have storage and all kinds of other things. But if you just want a simple kneeboard to attach the iPad to your leg, and you don't want to have to worry about cases and sizes and all this, uh, the MyClip Multi is a great option because it's pretty much a universal fit. And then I also think part of staying organized is having some type of bag. Uh, again, especially if you're a renter and you've got to carry your gear with you, I really think it's smart to have a bag to organize all your stuff so you can get to it quickly in flight. These are my two favorites for the iPad because they're both really made for the iPad, the Flight Gear iPad bag and the Flight Outfitters lift bag. They have slots dedicated for the iPad. They're that vertical style, so things are easy to access in flight and uh, a good way to stay organized in the cockpit. All right, let's dive into some pre-flight planning. I think this is a really good area for all of us to do better. And what I'm trying to get you to do here is not fall into the METAR radar file trap, meaning I'm gonna fly today, let's check the radar. Nope, no red, and let's look at the METARs. Okay, it's VFR, let's file a flight plan and get out of here. Well, that may work for a local flight in a familiar airport, but it's not really the best way to plan. There's a lot more that should go into a good flight planning session than just METAR and radar. A couple of things to think about. One is the chart supplement, what used to be called the airport facility directory, the green book. A lot of us blow right past this information, but there are some things you can only find in the AFD, like runway slope, night light activation. If there's a different frequency for the pilot controlled lighting, that's often the only place you'll find it. So this is available in popular apps. You can see ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot here. 
take a second if it's an unfamiliar airport to pull up that AFD tab and read through those notes and make sure you know what's going on there. I see a lot of people skip this step. Pre-flight planning. A lot of us self-brief these days, which is fine. You kind of make up your own pre-flight briefing flow, but apps like ForeFlight do have a very good graphical briefing service now. So you can get a an old school flight service briefing, but in a much more modern and easy to digest way. That's from the flights tab. You can tap the brief button after you've entered a flight plan and it'll walk through all the information a briefer would tell you, the synopsis, the air mats, the current conditions, the forecast, the notams. This is a very good way to systematically step through all the different parts of a weather briefing you should be considering. So if you haven't tried that before, go to the flights tab, put in some you know, basic flight plan route, and then tap brief and go through that. It sort of organizes it in chapters so it's easy to stay organized of what you've read and what you haven't. A really good idea on a longer flight in particular. One of the nice things that ForeFlight has in there that you may not have noticed if you haven't tried it recently is you can get some good weather charts in there. For example, you see here the cloud forecast. This is the new graphical replacement essentially for the old area forecast. This is the only place you can find cloud top forecasts. And it's a nice graphical representation, especially if you're trying to get on top or you're worried about icing. Uh, within that flights tab, within a briefing, you can see this and get a visual sense of how, how widely spread are those clouds? What are the bases? What are the tops? Uh, check that out if you haven't done a briefing in a little while. Another weather product that is fantastic that hopefully you're using is the forecast discussion. You can get this in the airports tab, go to weather, and underneath where you see your typical METAR and TAF, you'll see forecast discussion. This is what I call the color commentary. So if the METAR is the play-by-play -play man, here is what the weather is, and here's the TAF that's gonna tell me exactly what the conditions are gonna be. Well, the forecast discussion is really the forecaster explaining to you their thought process behind the forecast. How certain are they about those conditions? What are the overall trends? Um, I, especially if conditions are changing rapidly or you have questions about timing, uh, this is definitely something to look at because it'll give you some great insight into what the forecaster is looking at and really how sure they are. Sometimes they'll be pretty honest here and say, you know, I put it in the TAF, but it's not certain and could come earlier than that. So check that out. It's available in pretty much all the uh, electronic flight bag apps these days. A couple of graphical uh, weather products you should look at, I think, in ForeFlight. There is a turbulence forecast map and the icing forecast map. You can use the slider bars at the bottom for time and at the right for altitude. And this gives you a great 4D sense of the atmosphere. Where is there ice? Not just, okay, there's ice over Bismarck Airport today, but at what altitudes? And how about three hours from now? How about nine hours from now? Same for turbulence, where are the rough rides? These are computer models, but they've gotten a lot better over the last five or six years. These are really excellent products now. You do have to have a Pro Plus subscription to ForeFlight to get these on the map. But I think if you fly IFR, these are great tools. Uh, it, it's so much more valuable than just an air mat saying there could be ice somewhere around the Dakotas. This gives you a much better sense of what the conditions really are. So go to the maps page, tap on your map layer menu and check out both the icing and the turbulence layers. If you're in Garmin Pilot, these are also available. And one thing I'd point out is Garmin Pilot offers the option of looking at icing severity or icing probability. ForeFlight shows you the probability, which is what is the chance you're gonna encounter icing at that altitude and time. Garmin Pilot also gives you the option to look at, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, ForeFlight shows you the severity and it's light and moderate. Uh, you can look at Garmin both the severity and the probability. So what's the percent chance I'm gonna encounter icing there? Uh, and you can see the arrow pointing to that selection down there at the bottom right. Just an additional thing to be aware of if you're using Garmin, you have a, one more option there. Back to ForeFlight, if you're also looking at icing, be sure to check out the imagery tab. While that maps tab is a great place to check out a lot of things on kind of an interactive map, the imagery tab is the place to find a lot of the static graphics that uh, you're used to, including these great icing forecasts at different altitudes. Also think about the 3D on airspace and terrain. You can go in ForeFlight on the maps page, put in a route and then tap that profile view. And you may be familiar with looking at that for terrain and obstacles. That's great. But it also shows airspace. And you can tap on airspace to get a 3D sense of where that, how low does that MOA go? Uh, 
Uh, where is the Class B airspace there? This is very helpful, particularly for VFR pilots. So make sure you're using that profile view for airspace if you're in some unfamiliar terrain. Garmin, again, has a similar version. You can go to split screen, tap your split screen arrow there to bring it over, and then get that profile view of terrain, weather, airspace, pilot reports. A lot of information there in that side-by-side -side screen. Stadium TFRs uh, is something that is really important, except of course right now, because there's no sporting events going on. Uh, so this is something for pre-flight planning, unfortunately right now we don't have to worry about. But uh, when baseball, football season kicks off again, this is definitely something you wanna look at because these can pop up and ruin your whole day if you're not careful. So make sure you're considering TFRs as a part of your briefing as well. You can tap on those sporting event TFRs to get details on the times. Sometimes it can be confusing whether it's active or not. So when in doubt, tap on it. One new thing ForeFlight just added in version 12.2 last week is this really cool 3D preview. Uh, this is great for approaches. So if you're going to fly an approach into an unfamiliar airport, you can bring up that 3D preview and it'll load the instrument procedure. Like you see here, we're going to fly vectors to final for uh, runway six left at Dayton International. And it gives you a view of where are the waypoints, where are the step down altitudes, what does the terrain look like uh, for that approach. If you're going to an unfamiliar airport, especially if it's in the mountains, this is a great idea. I also like to look at FBO fees. This is something that's pretty important. Um, you know, fuel prices, FBO fees can ruin a fun trip with a big bill. Both Garmin and ForeFlight have done a nice job over the last couple of years of adding more and more information here. So in addition to fuel prices, you can get service fees. So spend a minute if you haven't been to the FBO before and check that out. Uh, that sometimes it, it does depend on fuel purchase and things, but at least get a sense for what the FBO is going to charge you and maybe even read some pilot comments. That is part of pre-flight planning. It's not just the airport you're going to, but the FBO you're going to. And then just a reminder on the flight plans, the ICAO flight plan format is required since last summer. So hopefully you've all been filing this and are all set up. Once you do the initial setup for it, it's really no different. It's just a couple of things you need to set up properly the first time. Um, it's filed the same way, everything else works the same, but if you haven't flown in a while, make sure you check out the ICAO flight plan format. You will need to set up an aircraft profile in your favorite app with some rather long equipment codes. All right, so those are some tips for doing better on the iPad pre-flight, going beyond just the radar and METAR. Now let's talk about that digital co-pilot part. And I say that because uh, a co-pilot does a lot of things. It provides timely information before and during a flight, calls out abnormalities, right? Sort of your check, of, you know, hey, watch your airspeed or watch your altitude. Helps the pilot with duties during high workload phases of flight. And of course, makes strong coffee. And at this time, the iPad cannot help with that one, but maybe they're working on that for the iPad Pro uh, fifth generation. All the other things though, the iPad does a pretty good job of. For example, cleared routing. If I'm gonna fly from Cincinnati to Atlanta, and I've never flown that before and I'm gonna do it IFR, how do I know what my route is gonna be? I could guess, I could file direct and get yelled at by ATC, or I could look at history. And all these apps, you see Garmin on the left, ForeFlight on the right. You can put in a departure and a destination and then tap on the routing and it will show you the most popular options. Garmin shows you the percentage of time, that's the route you get. ForeFlight shows you how many times uh, and how recently it was cleared. So if you look at ForeFlight there, you can see ATC cleared. The one that starts with Churchill 4 departure, Bowling Green, Nashville, that was last cleared today, and it's been cleared 1,075 times. That's a pretty good guess that if you're going between CVG and ATL, that's the route you're going to get. So use that tool. Find the flights, find the routes that ATC is clearing, and then tap on it and load it in your route. You don't have to type it all in. You can just tap on it and activate it. Same with NOTAMs. Uh, you know, the typical wall of text with a NOTAM, you have no idea what you're reading sometimes, especially at big airports. With runway and taxiway closures, I think ForeFlight does a great job here. Go to the plates tab, and it will automatically tell you how many NOTAMs affect that airport. Tap on that red box at the top, and it decodes it. It'll tell you what runway or taxiway it applies to, when it's effective, when it expires. This is a much easier way to read all this information than trying to just scroll through the text NOTAMs. So, 
especially a busy airport, always take time before flight, ideally, and certainly in crews before landing to make sure you've read these. I also like, once I've read these notams, to turn on the, the pencil tool there and mark up the diagram. So if it says runway 422 is closed, we'll turn on that red marker and cross it out. So it's very easy to interpret in a high workload situation. You can easily erase those before the next flight, but I think that's a great way to make the, the notams visual. Runway closures are also noted other places, which is helpful. You can see here in four flight, they're really trying to let you know that runway 422 and 1735 are closed. It shows up in the pop-up airport information and on the airports tab, so pay attention to those. When you're choosing an alternate, your iPad can also be a good digital co-pilot. Um, both Garmin and ForeFlight do a nice job here. If I need to pick an alternate, here we are, we're in the flights tab and I've got my departure and my destination and it has a spot for an alternate. Well, how do I know what alternate to pick? If you tap on it, ForeFlight will pop up some suggestions. It gives you the longest runway, it gives you the approach types, it gives you the weather for it and the time en route. So it can help you pick one that has the facilities you need, that has weather that's above your personal minimums and it lets you know how much of a deviation that would be. This is a much more thoughtful way, at least to get an initial read on where an alternate might be. ForeFlight all has some automatic calculations. If you're a Performance Plus subscriber, the $299 a year level, it will do runway analysis uh, for piston airplanes. They don't have it for jets yet, but uh, if you want to get uh, a takeoff distance, uh, 50 foot obstacle distance, your speeds, it will calculate all of that. Uh, another great co pilot kind of duty that it will tell you if your runway is going to be sufficient for the flight. If you're a Performance Plus subscriber, go to flights enter your route, and then you'll see next to your departure and your destination, little buttons you can tap for the runway performance for both takeoff and landing. Here's an example of your iPad being a co-pilot. Your takeoff total distance has ex exceeded the runway by 155 feet. That's its subtle way of saying, this is not gonna work. We need to pick a different runway. We need to pick a cooler time of the day. We need to pick a lighter weight. I mentioned earlier using the pencil to copy clearances. Uh, that does work pretty well. My only suggestion is use the templates. Most of these apps have a template for clearance, for ATIS, for a pilot report. That can keep you organized. So instead of just scribbling on a bank blank screen, make sure you're using those templates. Uh, it is much easier to read back and remember what you wrote down. Here's a cool feature where your uh, your phone or your iPad really is a, a digital copilot or maybe even a dispatcher. Uh, for flight on the higher subscription levels does offer pre-departure clearances. This is where you can get your IFR clearance by email or text message. Uh, you do not call ground control or clearance anymore. You get the text clearance, you put it in your GPS and you call ground and say, I'm ready to taxi. Uh, it does not work at all airports. It's mostly airline airports, about 75 right now. So it's not gonna work at a lot of smaller GA airports. But if you're flying into busy airports a lot, this is a great feature. It's a time saver. Uh, I've used it and it works well. One thing to point out is it does require that Performance Plus plan. And if your end number is enrolled in this, everybody who flies that airplane has to use that. So this is not optional. If you opt into PDCs, as they're called, you have to use it. Uh, ask me how I know when I called once and forgot about it and clearance delivery was not real happy with me. So great feature, but make sure if you sign up that you're actually gonna use it. Digital ATIS is another thing that's come to ForeFlight recently. This is available again at mostly bigger airports um, and you do have to have an internet connection so you won't be able to get digital ATIS in the air unless you happen to have in-flight Wi-Fi. Um, but this is a nice way before departure at least I like to look at Going beyond just a METAR report telling you the weather, this is the actual ATIS. So it's information Oscar here at Nashville. And you can see beyond the weather, the runway in use, um, various taxiway closures, bird activity, all those things. An another just final step on your way to the airport, maybe to check if your airport has digital ATIS. Glide Advisor is a great in-flight co-pilot tool. If the engine quits, can you make that airport? Well, ForeFlight, Garmin Pilot, these apps will give you a pretty good estimation. They consider your glide performance that you've put in. You can see here we've got 65 knots and a nine to one glide ratio for our 172. It will then com consider winds aloft and the terrain. So you can see that oddly shaped 
bluish line there, that's taking into account the wind and the terrain to let you know that you can make it to tall timber, but if you wanna to try to make it to that other one to the south of you, it's gonna be Marshdale. It's gonna be just on the edge of it. Um, this is a great feature. I don't fly with it on all the time, but especially in uh, mountainous terrain or low level, this is a really good thing to turn on because it takes a lot of the calculation out of what's really in glide range right now. ForeFlight also has checklist feature and it will even speak it to you, which a lot of people don't know. So if you wanna enter your own checklist, it has some templates, you can customize them, you can make them just the way you want, uh, but you can tap that speak button and ForeFlight will even read the checklist to you, which is really cool. Um, it, not everybody's a digital checklist person and that's fine, but it's at least an option you should know about, especially single pilot, this can keep your head up more often, uh, but still keep you checking in that checklist. You can also get quick access to the emergency checklist. That's at the top right there, that red button. So if uh, you need to get to an emergency in, a, in an instant, just tap that red button and you can quickly access one. Your digital co-pilot will also help you determine the best runway. If you go to the airports page and go to runways, here it's nice to know that runway 422 is 7,004 feet long, but look at that. We've got the headwind, tailwind, and crosswind components. So if it's a non-controlled airport, you can find out that runway 22 is the best because it has an eight to 10 knot headwind and a 12 to 16 knot crosswind. Uh, great math that does for you that just simplifies things a lot. What is your crosswind component? What is your personal crosswind maximum? Uh, what is your maximum for landing with a tailwind? Well, that math is all done for you here. Another thing that ForeFlight has really added to over the last few years is alerts, pop-up text alerts and audio alerts. You can go to the More tab, go to Settings, and you can see all the different alerts you have there. Uh, you can turn these on or off, uh, and they're really, really helpful. This really is like having a co-pilot sitting there making call-outs. If you feel like you're not getting one, go to that More tab, go to Settings, and check it out. The other thing to do is connect, if you can, your headset, uh, Bluetooth headsets like the Bose A20, Lightspeed Sulu, David Clark 1X, all of these can connect by Bluetooth to your iPad. And in addition to getting those pop-up alerts in ForeFlight, you can get audio alerts, which is again, a nice way to keep your head up out of the cockpit, but still get those alerts. So pair your headset to your iPad in the settings app with Bluetooth, and then you can get those audio alerts. And there's a whole bunch of them. Here are some examples. Uh, ForeFlight calling out the nearest altimeter setting uh, on a descent. Here's uh, calling out the nearest ATIS AWOS frequency for your destination airport. Uh, here it is giving you final approach runway. Make sure you're lined up for the right airport and the right runway. It'll give you warnings if you have an ADSB receiver or a panel mount ADSB. Give you traffic alerts, one o'clock, two miles, 200 feet, TFR alerts, obstacle and terrain alerts. These are all really, really helpful. Um, and and they, they're, pass, they're passive, they're sitting there waiting to go. They don't need you to activate them. Uh, it's your digital co-pilot watching over you. So make sure those are enabled and if you can pair your headset so you get the audio portion as well. Here's a great one uh, that would have prevented a, a rather famous accident years and years ago in Lexington, Kentucky. Entering runway 11, 4,700 feet remaining. Great check right before you hit the power up to max to make sure you are taking off on the correct runway and you have the length of runway remaining that you think you do. This is automatic if you have GPS driving your iPad, uh, but pay attention to this. Another great digital co-pilot feature is, uh, should be on by default. If it's not, again, go to the settings and auto show taxi chart. This way the iPad knows if it has GPS source as you land at your destination airport, as you slow through about 30 knots, it's smart enough to know that you are on the airport now, not in the air, and it will automatically pop up the taxiway chart. This is really helpful. So if you land at a busy airport and they say, turn right on Bravo, contact ground, you don't have to go flying around looking for the chart. It's right there in front of you with your airplane position on it. You can see where Bravo is and you have much better situational awareness, much less heads down time looking for the chart. So make sure that setting's on and make it a habit to follow that taxi chart after landing. One other co-pilot thing, and, and not a lot of us are doing international flying right now, but as that starts up again, um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are some apps and tools that are really helpful for the uh, EAPIS part as well. This is the digital manifest you have to file with customs. This is an app called FastPass, or excuse me, FlashPass, 
it really helps you do this easier instead of the rather clunky U.S. Customs website. You can submit your paperwork digitally. You can even do Canada, Bahamas, and CARICOM EAPIS. So anywhere pretty much Caribbean, um, Canada, great tool for simplifying the paperwork. All right, we're mowing through a lot of stuff, but I wanna finish with some talk on portable in-flight weather, because this is a really great way to take your iPad to the next level when you're in flight uh, and you're dealing with weather. Weather is still a common cause of fatal accidents in general aviation, but the accident record has been getting better recently. And I think part of that is due to the fact that more pilots are flying with data link weather. And if you use it wisely, it can make flying a lot safer, but you definitely have to use it wisely. So let's talk about some of those tips. Um, here's a great example, a long cross country in a 182 with some weather. Um, years ago, it would have been aim for the blue sky, hope it works out, talk to flight watch, maybe even cancel. This was a no problem trip on a 182 on this day with some data link weather. The difference is it's all self-service now. You know, most of us aren't walking into a flight service station asking for a briefing. Most of us aren't calling flight watch. It's really up to us to be the weatherman. And that's a good thing because we have more tools than ever before. We have a picture in the cockpit that's as good as anything a flight service briefer had 30 years ago, but we have to use it wisely. So let's understand real quickly, when we talk about data link weather, you get that either from ADSB or Sirius XM. ADSB, you've all heard tons and tons about for the last few years because of the 2020 mandate that just passed where you have to equip with ADSB out. That's the transponder part that helps ATC see you. Let's be clear that when we talk about ADSB weather, we're talking about the other side of the coin, ADSB in. This is optional, this is not part of the mandate. This allows us to receive weather and traffic in flight. It's very simple, there's a network of 700 plus ground stations out there, look like cell phone towers. They transmit weather on 978 megahertz. And if you have a receiver like a Stratus or a Sentry or a GDL, you receive that information and it then forwards it onto your iPad and boom, you have weather in flight. There's no subscriptions because your tax dollars paid for it, but you do need to be in reception range of a ground station. So typically 500 to 1000 feet AGL to start picking it up. But it works really, really well as thousands and thousands and thousands of pilots have learned over the last five, six, seven years. You get radar, METARs, TAFs, PIREPs, you can also get traffic. There are a whole host of portable receivers that are really great all-in-one units. Most of them have a battery, so they're totally wireless. Most of them have a GPS. They connect by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to your iPad. Many of them also have an AHAR, so you can get that backup attitude or synthetic vision display. So these are really all-in-one devices that take your iPad from more of a static chart viewer and into an interactive cockpit tool. With the Stratus or Sentry or GDL plus your iPad, you've got moving map, you've got charts, you've got weather, traffic, backup attitude, a great all-in-one safety device. Uh, and anybody flying cross country, I think, should seriously consider flying with one of these. There's tons of options. I'll give you just a couple to think about. Uh, one of the newer ones is Sentry Mini. This is from ForeFlight. Uh, really small and inexpensive, only $299. There's no battery. So you are gonna to have to plug it into something, either a battery pack or a cigarette lighter, but it's a great price, a good performer. It gives you GPS, ADSB weather and traffic. If you're looking for the lowest cost, easiest, get me weather on my iPad, this is a great option for it. If you wanna step up a little bit, the full size Sentry has the same features, but adds a 12 hour battery, adds an AHARS for that backup attitude and synthetic vision, and even adds a carbon monoxide detector. So this is my all-in-one to me. This uh, gives you all the features you need in a small package, battery life lasts all day, and $4.99. And then Stratus 3 at $6.99, uh, all, all the same features minus the carbon monoxide detector. It does have a built-in flight data recording module, and it works with a variety of apps. So the Sentry, Sentry Mini work with ForeFlight. Stratus 3 works with ForeFlight, but also WingX, Flight Plan Go, uh, FlyQ, New app I'll talk about here in a minute. So uh, more compatibility there. Also has the option for remote antennas if you wanna blind mount this out of the way. The other option besides ADS-B is Sirius XM. So whereas ADS-B broadcasts weather information up from the ground, Sirius XM broadcasts it down from satellites. That means that you can receive weather anywhere in the US, on the ground, any altitude. There are no altitude restrictions, no coverage restrictions. You can be on the ground in the middle of Wyoming and get a full signal. Uh, so that is great. 
the downside is you do have a monthly subscription you'll be paying, typically the 30 to $50 a month range. Um, but you can pause that for periods of time. So if you don't fly in the winter, say, you can pause a Sirius XM subscription. Um, and this is a great option because you don't have to worry about those coverage areas. And you also can get Sirius XM radio, which passengers a lot of times really like. You can listen to the ball game or music. Um, you can get Sirius XM right now with a GDL 51 or 52. Those are Garmin receivers that work with both for flight and flight plan go and uh, Garmin Pilot. So pretty good app compatibility now with those GDLs. And you get access in addition to the coverage, you get access to more weather products. So you can get radar into southern Canada. You get a richer uh, radar picture. You can get storm tracks and cell tops. So you can know not just that it's yellow or, or orange, but that storm sells 30,000 feet and moving 23 knots. You get coverage down into the Bahamas a little bit. Uh, and XM radio. So a premium product, you're going to pay more for it because of the subscription, but you do get more for it. ADSB has also been upgraded in the last year or two. There's some new weather products. If you haven't flown in a while, you should check out. You can get forecast cloud tops, forecast turbulence. That's that turbulence layer we were talking about before. You can get in flight now. Center weather advisories and lightning strikes. Uh, lightning's helpful well, ADSB only shows cloud to ground lightning, not the cloud to cloud lightning as well. It's still helpful because it's a big question with a lot of uh, in-flight weather when you're looking at it is, is that convective? Is that yellow cell there just rain or is it thunderstorm and it's gonna give me a bad or potentially unsafe ride? Well, lightning's another clue to help you determine that. So uh, if you're around convective weather, I suggest you turn on lightning to overlay that on top of your radar. Here's a look at some of those. You can see cloud tops on the left, lightning strikes below, center weather advisories and turbulence. Pretty intuitive, you know, they're graphical. Uh, they give you an idea of, of uh, what you're looking at in sort of a 2D sense. Some of these things like cloud tops, you can see that slider bar on the right side of the screen tells you where are the cloud tops. Right now we have 9,000 feet selected. So the blue area would be showing the clouds are still at 9,000 feet, but to the west of us there, you're on top of the clouds at 9,000 feet. A couple of tips real quick, and, and we are, are going to have a webinar in the future on data link weather, go into all the details of this, but a couple of quick tips. Philosophically, when you're flying with data link weather, it's not real time. You've probably all heard that, and it's true. That doesn't mean it's not useful. It just means you have to use data link weather for strategic deviations. So the idea of data link weather is not to pick through tightly spaced cells. Look at the picture on the screen there. If we were going to fly to the south near Muncie to get to Indianapolis, you would not use data link weather to go up to that line of scattered storms there and pick our way around it. That's not the idea. The idea is to look hundreds or 50 miles out and say, there's bad weather up there. We're going to go all the way around it. So we're going to change our flight plan and just swing all the way around the east end of that weather. That is the right way to use data link weather to use it to make a theory about the weather ahead, to make big deviations ahead of time, and then make those deviations before you even get close to it. And really the right way to use data link weather is as an assistant to your eyes. Because at the end of the day, your eyes always win. If the radar says it's clear, but your eyes see an ugly black cloud up ahead, you shouldn't fly through it, no matter what the radar says. So as it says there, don't ever let data link weather talk you into something your eyes aren't comfortable with. The way I use data link weather is to get a big picture view of things, deviate well around the weather, not pick through it, uh, but then use my eyes as a backup. So if the radar says there's a line of storms and I think I'm going around the east side of that line of storms, I'll make sure that my eyes agree with what I think I'm doing there and that I really am staying clear. Uh, even when I'm flying IFR, a lot of times I'll take deviations to stay VFR and do uh, avoidance visually. That's still the safest way. Now, if you're in a turbine aircraft, you have onboard radar, you can you can pick your way through a little bit more. But there's a difference between onboard radar, which is pretty much real time and mounted to the airplane, and data link weight radar, which could be five, even 10, 12 minutes old. Uh, it's just a different tool. So data link weather is great. I fly with it on every flight. I think it is uh, a great safety enhancement, but make sure uh, as a pilot that you're using it for what it's good for. I want to close real quick with just a couple of uh, new things to think about, accessories, apps uh, that may be of interest to you. One is uh, just yesterday, Apario, the company that makes uh, Stratus, introduced a new app 
called Stratus Insight. Uh, they bought the AeroV app uh, of last year, which was a, a smaller app, but a popular one. Um, and they bought it and have overhauled it and released it as Stratus Insight. It is a competitor for four flight or Garmin Pilot these days. We got some nice things, all the things you'd expect with charts, moving maps, synthetic vision, in-flight weather. Uh, it works on iPad, iPhone. They also have a very good Apple Watch app. Um, it has some interesting things as well. It has speech to text translation. So if you plug in a separate audio cable, it will listen to the radio transmissions and translate what it hears into text, kind of like visual voicemail on your phone. Uh, it's $100 a year, as I said, just announced yesterday, but kind of a new uh, player in the electronic flight bag app world. So something to check out. Another relatively new thing is from Ithra, uh, a company founded by a general aviation pilot and RV builder. They are interested in monitoring the pilot, just like a lot of us monitor the airplane. So they offer wireless pulse oximeter to check your blood oxygen carbon oxide detector and a portable oxygen tank monitor. All three of those can uh, connect by Bluetooth to your phone or iPad, and it basically gives you a monitoring tool for all of these things on your uh, mobile device. So instead of having to read a screen or crane your neck around and look at the oxygen bottle, you can see it in your iPad. Kind of a neat idea, the, the app is free, you pay for the sensors, but they all play together nicely. Um, and I think it's just an interesting concept to start monitoring the pilot uh, a lot of the same way we monitor the engine or the weather. A lot of us right now are probably not flying as much as we were a month or two ago, and uh, that's disappointing, but there are great options out there for staying current, keeping your head in the game. Uh, one that uh, we're seeing tremendous interest in right now is Sporty's Pilot Training App. This is our all-in-one training app, has over 20 courses from basic private pilot instrument rating. There's a flying with four flight course in there that is great for learning your EFB app, aviation weather, Garmin avionics training. You can fly aerobatics with Patty Wagstaff. These apps make it really easy to stay current, I think. You can't practice crosswind landings, but you certainly can stay up on a lot of things, whether it's instrument procedures or avionics or regulations. I would encourage you to use these apps, uh, stay current, keep interested in aviation, uh, maybe learn a new skill, maybe start thinking about that next rating. Uh, Sporty's Pilot Training app works on your iPad, iPhone, Android, even works on Apple TV and Roku, so you can watch it on your couch. Uh, but check it out, there's a, there's a free airspace course right now you can take if you wanna try it out. Sign up for Pilot's Guide to Airspace and refresh your knowledge there. One other thing, if you're stuck at home right now, is flight simulators. And what a lot of people may not know is that if you're using ForeFlight for your EFB app, ForeFlight plays pretty well with most home flight simulators. So for example, X-Plane 11, which is uh, the most popular flight sim that we see out there these days, works more or less natively with ForeFlight. Uh, if you're on the same Wi-Fi network, you can go into X-Plane and essentially broadcast your sim position. And then you can pull out your iPad and fly your iPad just like you do in the airplane. Uh, ForeFlight also works with Redbird with the Cygnus product. It'll work with Prepare 3D and the older Microsoft Flight Sim X as well. That one does require an add-on piece of software. It's not really expensive, but a few more steps there. Uh, but especially if you're flying with X-Plane, uh, I encourage you to try that out, keep your skills sharp, and practice with ForeFlight as a great way uh, to stay current without being in the airplane. All right, with that, I wanna save just a couple minutes for questions. I know we moved through a ton of material, uh, but hopefully gave you something new to think about and uh, be happy to answer questions. Chris, have we got some things that came up that folks uh, wanna talk about? We do, John. We have quite a couple, quite a few questions from the attendees. We'll start off with the first one. Are you able to write on the iPad with the pen if your hand is resting on the screen also? Good question. Uh, the answer is yes, most of the time. So your the um, the P Apple Pencil is actually paired to the iPad. It's it's making a uh, very small lag, but uh, there is a little bit of a lag, like milliseconds. Uh, so yeah, you can in general. Now it's a little finicky once in a while. If you rest your whole hand and move it, it'll get a little confused, but I've had good success with it. That's one of the benefits of an Apple Pencil versus just a generic stylus whereas a stylus is just simulating your finger, the Apple Pencil actually is paired to the iPad itself. So it's a little bit of a smarter stylus. Okay, uh, next question we have, 
Any suggestions for using the Apple Watch as an aid beside using the timer function with the iPad? Yeah, good question. The Apple Watch, you know, when it first came out, a lot of aviation companies developed apps for it. And then some of them have kind of faded over the years. Uh, Forflight removed, I think, their Apple Watch app. In my experience, the Apple Watch can be helpful um, for notifications as a worst case backup. The screen is just not big enough for daily use on it. Um, you know, it's just it's just not what it's made for. So I think there are some things that are helpful for monitoring. Um, you know, you can you certainly use it as a, a timer, as was mentioned. I think we might see some things in the future. You know, there's rumor about an Apple Watch having a pulse oximeter built in, maybe that can monitor your blood oxygen. Things like that start to be interesting. Um, I mentioned the Stratus Insight app. That probably has the best watch app overall. You can look at radar pictures and um, airport diagrams. You can even set up a complication so that your watch home screen, in addition to showing the time, shows a local METAR. So there are some helpful uses there, but it's certainly not a must have. And, and again, I would much rather use my phone as a backup than the watch, I think. All right. A uh, question we had come in, does the forecast option work in Canada? Um, it depends on what forecast and what app, but um, most of those weather, weather products are US specific. Many of them have a Canadian version. Um, and both, I should mention that both uh, ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot have full Canadian charts, airport data, bases, all that, and they have Canadian weather products, but most of them do divide their weather products by region. So for example, you go to the ForeFlight imagery tab, you will pick USA and then pick your weather product. So uh, in general, there's something similar for Canada, but it's not going to be the same forecast. Okay. And then we had a question for general aviation. Is there much difference between the Garmin Pilot and ForeFlight app? They seem very similar. Great question. This is the this is one of the most popular questions we get. Um, I always tell people Garmin and ForeFlight are sort of the Coke and Pepsi. They're really both great apps. Uh, over the years, they've added a tremendous number of features, so they pretty much do uh, all the essential things: pre-flight planning, charts, airport information, weather, you name it. Um, it's mostly personal preference. Uh, I think it's sort of what makes sense to you. So both you can try for free. I encourage people. A uh, couple things to think about. One, we have a long article on iPad Pilot News. You can read for flight versus Garmin. We kind of go through, through some of the pros and cons. Two, download them both. Try it yourself sitting on your couch. See what makes sense to you. Whichever one you find easier, I think, is probably the right choice. Um, in general, if I had to make some assumptions, people I talk to, um, it seems like most people think for flight's a little more intuitive it has a few more high-end features, especially that Performance Plus subscription, whether it's pre-departure clearances or runway uh, calculations or cloud documents, things like that. But Garmin is strong, as you would expect, in panel avionics interface. So if you fly with a panel full of Garmin, you've got a G600 TXI and a GTN 750 and a flight stream. If you've got a whole lot of Garmin avionics, Garmin has done a whole lot of things to really make their app an extension of the panel. And so if you're flying with a lot of Garmin avionics, I would consider that as well. Also, just because the Garmin app looks very much like Garmin avionics, so you're going to feel at home with it. So there's really not a right answer. They're both excellent apps. Um, I would suggest you try them both out and see which one makes sense for you, because a lot of that comes down to personal preference. Very, very well. And I'm scanning through. We've had quite a few questions come in in the last few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I keep responding to these as time goes on, but I believe that covers it, John. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hope we gave you something to think about, and I uh, hope to see you again on a Sporties webinar in the future.